Welcome back to the Anti-Social Studies Podcast, a place for people who wish they'd stayed awake in high school. Last time we explored the age of imperialism. It was really uplifting. We looked at Africa, India, and the Pacific. The West was able to successfully conquer most of the world through its advanced technology and ruthless superiority complex. But now, they're going to attempt to crack open the big guys. Some of these are the empires that we've been talking about all season, the heavy hitters in world history, China and the Middle East. And others are new, young powers that have been partially adapting to the rise of the West, Russia and Japan. Who will be left standing by the 20th century? Mm, Japan. And who will succumb to the rise of the West? Mm, Everyone but Japan. All right, let's get to history. Act 1. Opium is a gateway drug. By the 1800s, China is ruled by the Qing dynasty. This was a vast, multicultural empire, the fourth largest in world history, that was ruled by a group called the Manchu from Manchuria. They kept most of the Chinese system the same, the Confucian exam system to run the government, etc., but they put their people, the Manchu, on top. And they presided over 300 years of prosperity in China, but by the 1800s, they were in decline. The leadership was very conservative and refusing to recognize the changing world. Remember, in the 1800s, the West is industrializing and setting up vast empires, while China is still shutting its doors and hoping things will go back to the way they used to be. But China still has the power. They have tons of luxury items like silk and porcelain that the new middle class in Europe wants to prove its wealth. And they have tea, which factory owners are using to drive production by giving it to their workers to help keep them awake back in England. China also has huge markets that the Europeans would love to tap into, but the Europeans don't really have anything that the Chinese desperately want besides silver from the New World. Also, all Europeans are restricted to only trading through the port city of Canton, and that is highly regulated by the Chinese government. As part of this Canton system, European merchants are monitored, they're not allowed to learn Chinese, they can only live in one part of the city, and cannot travel or do business anywhere else. This is what we call a trade imbalance, and it is swinging pretty heavily toward China right now. Everyone's trying to get into China and negotiate a better trading agreement. The Russians and the Dutch both send trade delegations. The British send two. The last one gets expelled from China for refusing to perform the kowtow, the traditional series of bows you're supposed to do when you meet the emperor. And this is the last straw. The British are like, uh, I'm sorry, do you know who we are? We're the freaking British Empire. The sun never sets people? Yeah, that's us. So they go back to London and start plotting. I know, they think. Let's get them addicted to drugs. And they do. Check this out. The British has access to opium. A lot of it, from their colonies in Indonesia and in India. So, they do what anyone would do. They start smuggling opium into China and selling it to merchants. The illegal trade became so important that they developed new ships called opium clippers that could carry the weight of the tons of opium that had extra protection against pirates and Chinese officials. After many diplomatic warnings, the Manchu did not want opium coming into their borders, the Chinese emperor eventually sent one of his officials down to Canton. In 1839, he seized 20,000 chests of opium, almost 3 million pounds of the drug, and declared a blockade against foreign trade in Canton until the British stopped smuggling in the drug. Using this as their excuse, the British sent the Royal Navy in to defend its merchants, and the British quickly defeated the Chinese and forced them to sign the Treaty of Nanking, known as the Unequal Treaty. This treaty that ended the so-called Opium War opened up five new ports to foreign trade, gave the British control of Hong Kong, and gave them the power of extraterritoriality. This really long word means that British people in China are not subject to Chinese laws, and they can only be punished under the British justice system. But that wasn't enough, and Britain eventually won a second Opium War, after which they were given most favored nation status, meaning that they got special trading privileges no other country got. By the end of the Opium Wars, the Chinese coast was divided into economic spheres of influence, with different port cities effectively controlled by foreign governments. By 1900, China was still technically independent, but its trade was heavily controlled by Russia, Japan, Britain, France, and Germany. 
Think of this like if you've ever learned about the mob or the mafia, how they would have so much control over different cities in the United States that they effectively were the government. This is sort of how these different economic spheres of influence worked in China. Okay, so let's think about this from the Chinese perspective. They have been stable, strong, and basically unconquerable for thousands of years, if we don't got the Mongols because they kind of do everything else no one else does. And remember that the Chinese viewed themselves as the middle kingdom, the center of the civilized world. To them, the Europeans were barbarians, unworthy of their concern. And now, all of a sudden, they are essentially a tributary state of the West, a position they are very familiar with, but from the other side. China is going to essentially freak out. They are not okay with this, and they know that something needs to be done. But the problem is that China is so vast and diverse and hard to control that they're not going to agree on what needs to be done. And this is going to be the difference between China and Japan. But we'll get to Japan in a minute. First, how do the peasants respond? The threes. Remember the man of heaven? It's this idea that the emperor gets his right to rule from the heavens, but... If he loses the mandate, then bad things will happen. Environmental disasters, war, etc. So to traditional peasants, like the opium wars are about as close to complete disaster as they can imagine. And they believe that the emperor has clearly lost his mandate. Meanwhile, there's this peasant guy wandering around the countryside yelling about how the emperor needs to be overthrown and how they need to instate a new China. His name is Hong Shu Quan. He was a scholar who had failed the Confucian imperial exam multiple times. And that's not rare, less than 1% pass those tests. But when he was in the city to take the exam, he met a Christian missionary who gave him some pamphlets that he kept, but didn't really pay much attention to. After failing the Confucian exam for the fourth time, Hong Shu Quan had a nervous breakdown. Supposedly, he had a vision that he visited heaven where he found his celestial family. His heavenly father, wearing a black dragon robe, told him that it was his job to rid the world of demon worship. The people were supposed to be worshiping his father, and Hong Shu Quan must show them this with the help of his celestial older brother. Supposedly in this vision, he saw Confucius being punished in the heavens for leading the people astray. When he came to, he found those pamphlets that the missionary had given him. And after reading them, he believed that this was the key to his vision. The father he had seen was God, and he was his youngest son. Hong Shu Quan believed that he was the younger brother of Jesus Christ, and it was his job to lead China into the light by overthrowing the Qing dynasty and setting up a Christian kingdom. Y'all, I love this guy so much. All right, so I've tried to avoid passing judgment on historical figures' spiritual visions, like Muhammad, Joan of Arc, sure, why not? Because for a historian, whether they actually had visions from God doesn't really matter, They believed that they did, and thus acted accordingly. But this one is too good. Like, he read a pamphlet. A pamphlet. Not even the whole Bible. But this is a pretty cool example of how Chinese ancestor worship mixed with Christianity to create something new. This is called syncretism. Different religions mixing together. This idea that he could visit his ancestors, in his case, God and Jesus Christ, in a dream and communicate with them is as old as China. Remember the oracle bones from the ancient era? Anyway, so he goes around destroying everything that is traditionally Chinese, especially anything associated with Confucianism. And Hong Shu Quan does get some converts, mostly people who had also failed the rigid exam system. So if I can be cynical for a second, that's what this is. Hong Shu Quan definitely believed he was sent from God, but I don't think his followers did. They were frustrated by the traditional exam system that had kept them in the dark just because they couldn't pass a ridiculously hard standardized test. And they were fed up with the way China was being torn apart by outside barbarians, so they just went with it. Sure, you're Jesus' brother. Hong Shu Quan's movement joined with other peasant revolts in process to become the Taiping Rebellion. At its height, Hong's army controlled 30 million people. The Civil War lasts for over a decade, and it actually overlaps with the American Civil War, for reference. In the end, 20 to 30 million people died, making it one of the deadliest conflicts in human history. Aren't you surprised that you never learned about this in history class? Me too. The Taiping Rebellion was only able to be put down because the Qing emperor had to rely on foreign aid from Britain and France, who didn't want the system that they had just built up to come crashing down. And the Qing had to empower regional leaders to build up their own armies, and this is important. 
China has always been essentially feudal. Yeah, the emperor's in charge, but day to day, local rule is way more important. And the emperors have always tried to downplay that so that they can centralize power. But at this point, they have to admit that they can't. Regional warlords rise up and they ally with the Qing to put down the rebellion. But now that they have this power, they're not going to easily give that up. More on that in a second. After the Taiping Rebellion, the Confucian scholars are shook. They realize that China is crumbling and they need to do what they can to strengthen it before it collapses. They institute a thing called the Self-Strengthening Movement, which was a 30-year attempt to reform China to help it compete in this new world. They began adopting Western technology and weapons, they built shipyards, and they hired European advisors. It's a good idea, but not everyone in the court agreed with this plan. In fact, most of them believed it violated their entire Confucian worldview. Remember, merchants are the lowest of the low, and China's the middle kingdom that can do whatever they want. And the biggest opponent of this self-strengthening movement is Empress Dowager Shishi. Even though there were often others technically in charge, she effectively ruled China from 1861 until 1908 through her husband, her nephew, and her son. And she was violently against foreign intervention, and she opposed the self-strengthening movement from the beginning. She was a traditionalist. Eventually, her view won out, and the self-strengthening movement was abandoned. The imperial government stuck its head in the sand and ignored the changing world outside. The best example of this is when Empress Shishi took the money that it was meant to build up an imperial navy, and instead she spent it restoring a marble boat that sat in a man-made lake at her summer palace. A marble boat. It was basically a big screw you to all the scholars who were advising the court to invest in new technology. She thought, nope, I'm just going to renovate this hundred-year-old statue, basically, that was built to symbolize the everlasting power of the emperor. Ugh, irony, my old friend. By the early 1900s, there are a lot of different groups who disagree on basically everything except the fact that the Qing dynasty needs to go. They are all going to unite together to overthrow the emperor in 1912, and inspired by Western nationalism, they don't put a new emperor in his place. Instead, they're going to attempt to set up a modern democracy that will quickly devolve into civil war, but more on that in the 20th century. So China is basically the worst case scenario out of these four empires. They were completely unwilling to adapt, and they fell apart because of it. And there are two powerful empires that watch this happening and learn at least a few lessons on what not to do. Act 2. Russia and the Ottomans try their best. So, if you'll remember, Russia had already jumped on the westernization bandwagon thanks to Peter the Great. So let's pick up where he left off. Peter's daughter Elizabeth was ruling Russia. And I don't know what it is about Elizabeth's, but they are crushing that glass ceiling. Her nephew was the heir to the throne, but it was his wife, Catherine, who would really carry out Peter the Great's vision. And I love Catherine the Great. Catherine's husband, Peter the Great's grandson, was neurotic, rebellious, and an alcoholic. He also worshipped a guy named Frederick II of Prussia, who was the enemy of his aunt, the current Tsar Empress Elizabeth. Catherine, on the other hand, was born in Germany, so she was already westernized, and she was ambitious, intelligent, and level-headed, everything her husband wasn't. Yeah, she had multiple lovers. It's rumored that none of her three children were fathered by her husband. But what is clear is that she wanted power for herself. When the Empress Elizabeth died during the Seven Years' War, this is what Americans call the French and Indian War, so just before our revolution, Catherine took control of the army, who preferred her to her husband, who had just negotiated peace with their enemy, Prussia. What the heck? Catherine marched into St. Petersburg and had herself declared Empress. Nine days later, her husband was assassinated by one of her supporters, and she was eventually crowned in Moscow, and she would rule for 34 years until basically the end of the 1700s. And she's the first woman that gets a the great on her name. I love her. So let's talk about it. By the end of Catherine's rule, Russia added 200,000 square miles to its territory and established itself as one of the major powers of the world. She created free universal education for all free people. Yeah, Russia still had serfs who were tied to the land and they weren't considered free, but still. She also established the Smolny Institute, which was the first school specifically for girls and the first state-financed higher education institute for women in all of Europe. This school was reserved for girls of noble birth, but the next year she established a school specifically for daughters of commoners. Catherine divided Russia up into over 50 provinces and 500 districts based on population, and she expanded local administration. 
Again, someone copying and pasting from the Persian playbook. Catherine instituted economic reforms that led to the rise of a middle class, and she created rubles, the first paper money issued by the Russian government ever, to make up for shortages in gold and silver. She also oversaw the establishment of the Free Economic Society, which was a really forward-thinking collection of economists and scholars who were tasked with modernizing Russia's agricultural system. They were endowed with a massive library, and they operated without any government oversight. Finally, Catherine created the Instruction, which proposed a new codification of laws that established ideas in Russia like all men should be equal before the law. All of these reforms earned her the title of an enlightened monarch. She was pen pals with Voltaire, the guy who was calling for freedom of speech and religion in France. She herself wrote comedies, fictions, and memoirs. The Hermitage is still one of the largest and oldest museums in the world, and it started as her personal collection. Catherine was truly great. But just like Peter, she never took steps toward constitutionalism or limiting her own power in any way. For example, a popular rebellion broke out amongst the peasants, led by a guy named Pugachev, who set up a government in the name of Catherine's assassinated husband. They proclaimed the emancipation of the serfs, and they controlled a significant amount of land, but Catherine's army eventually crushed the revolt, executed the leader, and reasserted absolute control. But this largest peasant uprising in Russian history is foreshadowing for a few other events over the 1800s that will eventually topple Tsarist Russia. By the mid-1800s, after Catherine, Russia is growing exponentially, and if you want proof, look no further than the Crimean War. This was an attempt to to take control of a lot of the parts of Eastern Europe from the Ottomans that Russia has always wanted to control. Sorry, Putin, you weren't the first Russian leader interested in the Ukraine. And even though Russia lost the Crimean War, it was a sign of how powerful they were becoming that the Ottomans could not defeat them on their own. They had to turn to Britain and France for support. So what was going on in the Ottoman Empire? Remember that the Ottomans were not as willing to make changes internally, especially considering they were a theocracy that based most decisions on the Quran. But the near defeat in the Crimean War and the rise of Western powers nearby made them realize that they had to make some changes. Over the reign of two sultans, the Tanzimat reforms were instituted. These reforms guaranteed life, property, and respect for all subjects of the empire, regardless of race or religion. They standardized the tax system and military conscription to make both processes more fair, and they guaranteed equality for Christians and Jews within the Ottoman Empire, although they were already generally treated better than religious minorities in other civilizations. The Tanzimat reforms also moved the Ottoman Empire slowly away from its Islamic fundamentalism. They created secular or non-religious schools, representative assemblies, and new laws modeled after those in France. And, importantly, those new laws would be administered by state courts, not the ulama, or Islamic religious council. So why do we care? Well, Turkey today is one of the most westernized countries in the Middle East, Even though its population is like 99% Muslim, they have a secular state and not a theocracy like we see in Iran or Saudi Arabia, for example. And there are a lot of reasons for this, but the Tanzimat reforms set the Ottoman Empire on the path towards moderate westernization that will continue into the 20th century. Eventually, there will be tension between the Islamic leadership and modernizers, especially a group known as the Young Turks. This tension will keep the Ottoman Empire from fully westernizing to the point where they can survive defeat in World War I, but we'll get there. Similarly, back in Russia, there's still tension between people who think Peter and Catherine went too far and those who think they didn't go far enough. Inspired by the French Revolution, a group of military officers led a revolt in December, it's called the Decemberist Revolt, that pushed for more liberal political reforms. The revolt was put down, but eventually other czars will try to modernize the Russian government, but never enough so that they lose any real power, and thus it's never really enough for the Russian people. Tsar Alexander II, for example, sets up local democratic councils and he emancipates the serfs, which are two huge steps toward a more democratic society, but he was assassinated and his successor returns to an absolute monarchy. However, the emancipation of the serfs is going to send ripples through Russian history that culminate with Vladimir Lenin. You see, Alexander II emancipated or freed the serfs, but that was about it. Meaning, he said, congratulations, you're free, you have all the rights of normal Russian subjects. The serfs went, woohoo, and then turned around and got slapped with all the terrible aspects of society without any support. They now had to pay rent on the land where their families had lived for generations, and so they got stuck in a land debt trap 
not unlike the sharecropping plight of former slaves in the United States at around the same time. These peasants, who've been stewing for about a century now about how they aren't getting all the rights and freedoms and the benefits of people in other industrialized societies, well, now they're free and in debt. And they're starting to think that maybe capitalism isn't working for them. If only someone had another option. So the Ottoman Empire is slowly falling apart, but they're trying to catch up as best they can. Some parts of the empire have already basically asserted their independence, often only to fall under the influence of Europe, like we saw in Egypt. And we leave Russia with an oppressive government and millions of newly emancipated peasants who are very unhappy that the government hasn't done more to help them survive in this new industrializing world. But it's fine. It's fine. I'm sure the czars will be fine. Both the Ottomans and the Russians fell into the trap of modernizing just enough to give their empires a taste of what was possible, but never fully changing their society in a way that would threaten their own power. And that makes sense. What good emperor legislates his own power away? It's going to take a few extreme events, warfare and revolution, to force each empire to modernize the government. But for now, let's look at the greatest success story of the 19th century. Act 3. Japan wins! So, if you can remember all the way back to Act 1, about 15 minutes ago, China was forced open by the British and had a chaotic, uncoordinated response. Pretty much everyone was unhappy with the situation, but they disagreed on what to do about it. The same thing is going to happen in Japan, except that they will be relatively unified in their response. And this is one of the benefits of having a smaller nation that's not fragmented into various ethnic groups like China. And this unified rejection of Western imperialism is going to put Japan on the path to dominate Asia in the 20th century. In Japan in the 1800s, the Tokugawa shogunate was still ruling the island. There was an emperor, again, going all the way back to that family in the 600s BCE, but he was just a figurehead. The real power was with the shogun, or the military leader. He commanded an army of samurai soldiers that were part of the feudal makeup of Japan, Essentially, the shogun was just the most powerful of all the feudal lords, or daimyo. And remember, the Tokugawa had closed off Japan from all outside influence except one port city where the Dutch were allowed to trade and share some cool ideas about science and technology. And by the 1800s, the Tokugawa were already experiencing some issues. For one, their tax revenue was declining. Ugh, taxes again! The government was collecting taxes on land, which is a problem because, one... Japan at this point has a finite amount of land, and two, they aren't tapping into the rising class of wealthy merchants who don't own land and thus don't have to pay much in taxes. Also, maintaining a massive army of samurai when you're not fighting anyone is really expensive, and across the island, the feudal system was slowly breaking down. The Japanese peasants were resisting being subjugated as farmers, and many of them wanted to earn money and status for themselves. Totally reasonable. So this is the backdrop upon which a guy named Matthew Perry visits Japan. And even though this guy was a slightly overweight Commodore of the 19th century U.S. Navy, I highly encourage you to picture him as the Matthew Perry who played Chandler on Friends. Could Japan be any more closed? (laughs) President Millard Fillmore, that was one of our president's names, by the way, Millard Fillmore. Anyway. He wanted to get the U.S. into Asia to compete with the British, French, and the Russians. So he tasked Matthew Perry with visiting Japan to negotiate a trade agreement. Matthew Perry decides that the best way to go about this is with a show of superior military force, which is probably smart considering Japan was led by a military government and had already shown that it was pretty unwilling to accept any foreign economic influence. So Chandler sets off for Japan with four warships. And he makes a big deal of this. He sails through the Pacific, making stops along the way. When he finally arrives in Tokyo, he delivers two very formal letters from President Fillmore and himself. And they both express a very intense desire to create better trading relations with the Japanese that will be mutually beneficial for both their economies. There's definitely some hints at what might happen if they don't, but these letters are relatively diplomatic. Perry leaves Japan and he goes to visit China where the Chinese have just lost to the technologically superior British, a fact that the Japanese are well aware of. But as promised in the letters, he returns six months later, this time with six ships and 100 mounted cannons. 
This is known as gunboat diplomacy. Sure, we have a nice sounding letter, but it's delivered by a huge warship with guns pointed at our head. And this time, he also delivered a letter that is easily one of my top five primary sources of all time. It is so gutsy and confident, I can't believe it. Listen to this. Matthew Berry first says that he can't believe that the Japanese still haven't opened up to trade with the U.S. in the last six months, and that he fully expects them to do so. If they don't, the U.S. will be required to take up arms and fight for this right. But here's the part that I love. Quote, When one considers such an occasion, however, the occasion that there might be war with the U.S., one will realize the victory will naturally be ours, and you shall by no means overcome us. If in such a situation you seek for a reconciliation, you should put up the white flag that we have recently presented to you, and we would accordingly stop firing and conclude peace with you, turning our battleships aside. End quote. You see, with this note, Matthew Perry had delivered the Japanese a bright, brand new white flag. So basically, he's saying, if you don't agree to our demands, you're going to need this. Because there is no way that you would win in a fight with the United States. So you might as well just surrender now. (laughs) Whoa. And it works. The Tokugawa shogunate gave in and signed an unequal treaty similar to the one after the Opium Wars. But the difference here is that the Japanese people were unhappy, like in China, but they coordinated a unified response that overthrew the Tokugawa shogunate and rejected the treaty with the U.S. Basically, the Japanese are like, yeah, that's cute, Americans. Nope. In the four years between Matthew Perry's arrival and the end of the shogunate, the Japanese economy was destroyed. Cheap foreign goods flooded the market and collapsed local industry, The influx of gold and silver threw off their tax structure and led to massive inflation. People had been frustrated with the corrupt shoguns who lived a lavish lifestyle for a while, but this was the last straw. A group of nobles, samurai, merchants, and peasants joined together to support the emperor and overthrow the shogunate, restoring power back to the emperor Meiji. This instituted a new era in Japanese history called the Meiji Restoration, and it lasted from 1868 to 1912, and it is the reason why Japan went from being a feudal island nation to a global imperial powerhouse in half a century. Remember the self-strengthening movement in China? It was what some of the Confucian scholars wanted to do to push out the British, build up their industry and military from within so that they could compete. Well, the Meiji Restoration is that, but successful. The emperor and his supporters undertake reforms in basically every aspect of Japanese life. They create an almost universal education system, for girls too, like really universal, that emphasizes literacy, science and technology, and patriotic loyalty to Japan. In just 45 years, the literacy rates jump from 35 to 75% for men and 8 to 68% for women. 8% of women could read... And like 45 years later, 68% of women can read. That's insane. The Japanese also totally reformed and westernized their military. They eliminated the samurai and created a military draft. And they brought in Western advisors to help them build up a navy that would soon dominate the Pacific. Over the span of 20 years, Japan wins wars against both China and Russia. So if anyone thought that traditional land-based power was still the way to go, tiny Japan has thoroughly proven them wrong. Also, fun fact, a lot of these samurai who are out of a job turn and become merchants. They start to industrialize. There is one former samurai who went into arms dealing. So he like started to build up cannons and industrialize weaponry and he sold it to the government. He eventually turned to transportation and he founded a company called the Mitsubishi Company. So yeah, if you drive a Mitsubishi, it was founded by a former samurai. And here's the amazing part. The Japanese also reformed the government. I say this because in the past we've seen that absolute rulers basically never willingly give up power to create a constitutional government. The only other example we've seen is King Pedro of Brazil, who willingly shared power with the Creoles, but that was just because the alternative was a bloody slave revolt, probably. But in Japan, the emperor creates a parliamentary system with two houses, the higher house for the former nobles, and these people were elected. I mean, only about 1% of the population could vote, but still. This new constitution was presented to the people of Japan as a gift from the emperor himself, who would control the military and was also the only one who could change the constitution, so he still kept himself a lot of power. 
This was a similar setup to the new German state, who had a Kaiser in charge of the military and a parliament in charge of the government. So it's not a coincidence that both countries are going to rise to become the leading military powers soon after. The Japanese also copied the Chinese and created a merit-based government bureaucracy with a civil service exam to enter the government. It's basically like the Japanese were able to sit back for hundreds of years and watch all the other powers of the world set up and try different things. And then they just pick and choose exactly what they want to be successful. It's like that friend who plans their wedding by going to other people's weddings and just taking the things they like. Like, ooh, a cupcake tower, a photo booth, mason jars. The most important part of this reform is massive government-sponsored industrialization. They double down, and the government focuses most of its time and resources toward encouraging economic growth. They create new banks, build railroads, factories, and mines, and they allow private businesses to lead the way in a lot of this, but they're closely monitored by the government to make sure they're going along with what they want and need for their country. I can't imagine what that must have felt like to be living in Japan at this time. It's 50 years, and every aspect of your life is changing. It must have been incredibly exciting for some and really overwhelming for others. There's a Japanese anime show that's set during the Meiji period. It's called Ruroni Kenshin, and you can watch it on Netflix. Episode 3, called Swordsman of Sorrow, addresses this tension between those who want to keep the traditional ways and those who want to modernize. It's pretty great. But if you watch, make sure you do subtitles and not dubbing because the dub translations are truly terrible and not in a funny way, just like a distracting way. There's also this document that I swear I showed my students one time that I now for the life of me can't find. I maybe made it up. But the document, as I imagined it, was a Japanese man writing about how if someone had left Japan and traveled the world for just a few decades and then returned home, would he recognize anything? Or would he think he'd ended up in some new foreign land? It's a really beautiful piece of writing that captures that feeling of change and nostalgia for the past, but Google has failed me and I can't find it. If one of you finds it, please send it to me through my blog and you'll be my favorite listener of all time. So, the East has had mixed success resisting Western influence. The Chinese failed spectacularly and are now ready to get rid of the thousands-year-old dynastic cycle for something new. The Ottomans and the Russians do their best to be like the West, but they're never quite comfortable with constitutionalism and limiting their own power. They're wearing the clothes, but they're not fully committing. Both empires will be dead within 20 years. But Japan has shown what could have been. They rejected Western intervention in favor of modernizing themselves from within, while still maintaining their culture and nationalistic loyalty. And they are going to start expanding out across the Pacific, ultimately running up against another new power trying to set up an empire of their own, the United States. To be continued. For notes, pictures of some of the things I mentioned, and a full transcript of today's episode, check out my podcast page at www.antisocialstudies.org. And join me next time on Antisocial Studies as we explore World War I, or the war to cause all wars. And don't forget that if you like what I'm doing, please subscribe to my podcast so you'll know when the next episodes are up. And if you really like what I'm doing, then go to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and give me a review. Thanks. Thanks.